Welcome, everybody. Um, so, some of you have been here all day. Uh, and, and some, actually, some of us were all here last night and, and all day. Um, uh, and if you haven't been here all day, that's a reference to the fact that we, um, we opened the new front of the college. Um, so if you don't know LMH, then you will have taken that for granted. You will have thought that LMH was always a place of great elegance and um, beauty. Um, which it is now, but it wasn't always the case because um, we, we built a new front to the college uh, and the chancellor came and um, opened that today and we've, we've had a lovely day um, and a lovely lunch. Uh, some of us are pacing ourselves. Um, so when I say a lovely lunch, um, and we've got a lovely dinner to come. Um, um, but, the, but some of you are, are just here this evening for this um, annual occasion by... Um, through the great generosity of Donna Suzelle, who, if you came in through the front, uh, the gates there are now named in their honor. Uh, and they have, for some years, um, organized this lecture and dinner. Uh, so my job is to kick it off by introducing our speaker and, and, and Donna Suzelle themselves. So um, to start with our speaker tonight, who is Michelle Calipetis, uh, QC. Uh, and Michel was the former head of Littleton Chambers. He's got 40 years' experience as a practicing barrister in the field of general commercial and professional <coughs> negligence and employment work. And he's been more to the point in terms of tonight, he's been a full-time mediator for 10 years. He's recognized as an expert in mediation in both the UK and internationally, having mediated over 1,000 civil and commercial disputes. He's a distinguished fellow and director of the International Academy of Mediators, as well as a founding member of Independent Mediators Limited. He was the first chairman of the England and Wales Bar Council Alternative Dispute Resolutions Committee and a member of the working party that drafted the EU Code of Practice for Mediators. As a delegate for the International Academy of Mediators, he helped draft a convention for the enforcement of international commercial mediated settlement agreements, whose who legal elected him Lawyer of the Year for Mediation in 2016, and he won this year's award for Global Lawyer of the Year in the mediation category. So we're extremely lucky to have him uh, as the main uh, speaker tonight. Um, I should say something about Don and Suzelle, though some of you will know them well. Um, so Suzelle is a partner and co-founder of the US law firm Howarth & Smith. She has extensive experience in complex litigation, including class actions, antitrust, white collar crime, and professional malpractice. She has a BA degree, summa cum laude, with special distinction in political science from Boston University, a master of philosophy in politics degree from LMH here, and a Juris Doctor from the University of Virginia School of Law. She's an elected fellow of many legal organizations, including the prestigious 500 member International Academy of Trial Lawyers, where she serves on the board of directors. She's handled many high-profile cases in her career. Uh, she's recently acted for a prize-winning broadcast journalist in a major age discrimination uh, trial against NBC. You could tell us who that was later, or perhaps we know. Uh, she's represented victims of terrorism in a $2 billion case against Iran, which was decided in the US Supreme Court 6-2 opinion in Suzelle's favor in May 2016. Uh, and this year, she also represented a designer of bikini bathing suits, um, <laughs> as a difference, uh, in a copyright infringement action against Victoria's Secret. You can tell us about that over dinner as well. Um, <laughs> she's a frequent lecturer in law-related subjects for law schools and bar association groups in the US and abroad, and is a permanent visiting fellow of LMH and a member of the Board of Trustees of the University of Virginia Law School. So that's Suzelle. Uh, and Don is a partner and co-founder of the same firm. He received a BA degree from Harvard, his Juris Doctor from the Harvard Law School, and a Master in Public Policy from the Kennedy School at Harvard. He's an elected fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and one of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers. He was the lead counsel in the estate of Doris Duke Will contest in New York. Representing, he represented the NFL football players in antitrust litigation against the NFL owners. And this year, he completed a case for film director Roger Corman in a $75 million claim against offshore money managers 
and defended a major national health provider sued by the United States for over $2 billion under the False Claims Act. Donna Cizel, over 20 years ago, generously established uh, the Howard and Smith Law Fellowship Program, which brings two Oxford Law graduates each year to California for a law fellowship, complete with a beach residence in Malibu. Um, <laughs> Yes, that's a fairly stunning thing, which uh, 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 doesn't have any many faculties or many colleges. Uh, and the majority of, of more than 40 fellows who have been selected for the program through its existence are law graduates of LMH. Finally, Don and Suzelle have also served as counsel for LMH in the US. For example, they litigated a case involving a bequest to the college which was challenged by donors' relatives, where they achieved a very successful result for LMH. Um, thank you. <laughs> so tonight, um, we've got uh, this distinguished lineup of speakers and bring us their thoughts uh, to um, the alternatives to um, their traditional um, court battles uh, and as a way of resolving legal disputes. So now I'm going to hand over to Suzelle. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. We see many familiar faces in the audience and some new faces, but welcome to you all tonight. The way we set this up and the way it'll run for the next 45 to 50 minutes is it's going to be forest, tree, forest. So I'm a forest, and I'm going to give you an overview of alternate dispute resolution. Then Michelle is going to give you a tree analysis of a very specific issue in mediation, and then Don will wrap up with another forest look at some issues in mediation and arbitration. So, as I said, I'm going to I'm going to give you an overview, really a, a snapshot for those of you in the audience who are professional mediators or lawyers who do a lot of mediations and arbitrations. This is going to seem very basic. Michelle will talk about confidentiality and mediation, and Don will talk about some issues of alternate dispute resolution and problems and hopefully some solutions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Mine's a snapshot. So this is, this is discussing alternatives dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolutions. So the first question is, alternative to what? Alternatives to dispute resolution we mainly talk about are alternatives to the civil court system. The civil court system, as you all know, is ancient in both the United States and in Great Britain and the United Kingdom. Sovereign courts were established before there was written history. After there was written history, ecclesiastical courts existed, civil courts existed, they became separated. All of this was many, many centuries ago. In the United States, we've had <coughs> civil court systems since our country began. We inherited the system from England. We took it. We'd like to think we improved on it. Maybe you think we destroyed it. But um, in the United States Constitution, of course, in the Sixth and Seventh Amendments, the Sixth Amendment dealing with criminal trials, the Seventh with civil trials, the right to public trials is guaranteed and juries uh, in our Constitution. So even before there were civil court systems, there were other dispute resolution mechanisms, and one of them is to pick up clubs or sticks and batter each other over the head. The uh, cavemen are, are fighting with the clubs, and one of the cavemen says, I've in, in, invented a new way of, of resolving disputes. I call it the club. When I put this slide into the original presentation, I thought that it would be a lighter, amusing um, note. In light of the recent events in, in Manchester and the bombing, the suicide bombing in Kabul, this doesn't seem so funny to me anymore as it, as it once did, because we don't, <coughs> some of us don't seem to have moved that far beyond the cave people in resolving or attempting to resolve our disputes. But tonight, on a happier note, we're going to talk about what we believe is a more civilized way of resolving disputes, uh, not resorting to violence. Next slide. Bob. So alternatives to civil or court litigation. There are benefits to litigation, the traditional litigation in the courts, of course. In the United States, you're guaranteed a public trial. 
public trials are to keep us out of star chambers where things are decided in secret. Uh, in the United States, we believe that it's a very important constitutional right to be able to have a public trial which is observed so that fairness is not only done, but seen to be done. It also keeps a check on our judges and our juries because it's a public trial. They're independent, as you probably all realize, in the United States. We have an independent um, uh, division of our government, a branch of our government, which is the court system. It is independent from the executive, as our Mr. Donald Trump learned to his chagrin <laughs> recently, as not only the Ninth Circuit, the California court, which is believed to be quite liberal, but the Fourth Circuit in Virginia has also struck down Mr. Trump's ban on um, immigration, mostly directed at Muslims. So we have an independent branch of government, which is the court system. So you shouldn't be influenced by the legislature or by the executive when you bring your case into court. In the civil system, in the government system, there's a right to an appeal. So you have an automatic right from the trial court when you get a decision. If you are unhappy with that decision, you believe it was erroneous, then you have an automatic right to appeal, which is viewed as a virtue. And there are established rules in the court system. They're taught in our law schools. Lawyers understand them. Judges understand them. We speak the same language. We know what the rules of the game will be, the civil procedure, those rules that, that govern both the admission of evidence and the way we present our cases. And the system itself is state finance, the forum. So taxpayer money pays for the place that you go, the court, to resolve your disputes. There are also negatives to lit litigation, which is one of the reasons that alternatives to civil litigation have become such a big popular industry. It's expensive to litigate. You may have to go, you may be going into a court system which is taxpayer financed, but the cost of the lawyers, the cost of the going through the system can be quite extensive. The formal rules and procedures, there's a plus side to them, there's also a negative side to them. There are people who believe, and I believe Michelle may address this and Don certainly, that having a less formal way to resolve disputes where it's not so rigid and the parties can craft their own tailor-made rules and procedures is uh, more beneficial to, dis to resolving disputes efficiently. And then also in the government court system, you're assigned a judge. You don't choose the judge, you're assigned a judge, so you get what you get. In um, alternative to, there are alternatives to that, and people believe, it's thought, that if you can choose your own judge, you can get someone who has more expertise than the judge that you are assigned. Um, certainly there are questions about juries and whether juries of lay people are adequately intellectually equipped to resolve a highly complex commercial dispute, for example. Also, there are delays in the government civil court system. Uh, the number of filings in the year 1944 was 35,000. In 2015, it was 280,000 filings. The number of filings is vastly out outpacing the population. One of the, the, the things about this statistic, though, it, it is causing delays in our, in our system, and people are having to wait to get to trial, to get to the resolution of their cases. But it's also partly because our court system is not financed adequately in the United States, so that we have enough courts, enough judges, to handle the volume of claimants that are coming into the court system. But whatever the cause of it, it, um, we're having many, many more court filings which are calling, causing delays. So the time it can take you in the United States from the time you file your complaint to the time you get to trial is 33.2 months, which is, I think, a conservative statistic. Uh, Dawn, in my experience, is that it can take up to five years, sometimes even more, to get your case to trial. So that's considered a negative and one of the reasons, again, that alternatives to the civil court system have arisen. So ADR, Alternative Dis Dispute Resolution, is that something that's a new idea 
in our world? Is that something that's just come up because of the negatives to litigation that I just described to you? Well, the answer is no. Arbitration, which is one of the principal alternatives, alternatives to civil litigation, was very familiar in the old world. The Romans knew about arbitration and used arbitration back in the 5th century BC, the 6th century BC. The ancient Greeks used arbitration. And the merchants, the commercial actors, developed codes and procedures to resolve their own disputes because they were dissatisfied, to some extent, with the government court systems of the time. And they developed rules and regulations that actually got picked up by the, by the common law and the civil law. But it originated with the merchants getting together and deciding themselves they needed a better way to resolve disputes. Next slide. Arbitration in the United States goes back to the founding of our, of our country. George Washington, the first president of the United States, wrote a will. And in his will, he specified that if anyone disputed, any of his heirs disputed the will, that it would be decided not through litigation in the court system, but by three smart <laughs> men. And um, that those three smart men would not have to be bound by any of the laws of our country, that they could just get their heads together and decide what they thought was right, unhindered by what the particular law of estates and family law happened to be. So the two principal uh, alternatives to civil litigation are, of course, arbitration and mediation. And the reason I'm giving you this very basic distinction and definition between the two is that even very sophisticated clients, captains of injured in industry, CEOs, sometimes get confused and use the word mediation when they really mean arbitration or they use the word arbitration when they mean mediation. And they're very different, and it's very important to know which one you want and which one you're talking about. They share characteristics. Arbitration is a dispute mechanism that's decided by contract. It's voluntary in the sense that the parties get together and they voluntarily enter into contracts that govern the resolution of disputes that may arise in the future. They are binding. So when you enter into an arbitration agreement and you agree to arbitrate and go through that system, it is binding. It's not voluntary. Once you sign the contract, it's, it's, it's binding. The decision maker is chosen by the parties, or a mechanism for choosing the decision ma maker is chosen by the parties. And there's no appeal. And this is, this is quite a significant aspect of arbitrations. Unless you put into your arbitration agreement that you give yourselves the right to appeal, the common garden variety arbitration agreement does not allow you the right to appeal unless there's something like a bribed arbitrator, which almost never happens. But if there's some foul play like that, then you can challenge the arbitration uh, uh, decision, but otherwise not. Mediation is also an ancient concept, also in the old world, also in the, in the, from the ancient Greeks. Uh, Plato, the, the Socratic method, was a, an offshoot of that was the idea of mediating disputes, having a dialogue, having a discussion where there's mutual respect between the parties. And there's been lots written about the, the Greeks' uh, views of, of mediation. There's a, a famous, in this article that I, that I quote, there's a famous mediation about the rape of Persephone, where Hades kidnapped Persephone and took her to the underworld. And her mother, Demeter, was very upset about this and wanted her back. And Rhea, the, the mother of the gods, the queen of the gods, mediated a dispute. And in this article, this, this fictional mediation is, is laid out. But I was reviewing it for this talk. And I thought, there's an interesting thing about this that I didn't realize before. There's no voice that Persephone gives herself for her own rights. It's between Hades, her husband, and Demeter, her mother, about whether she's going to live in the underworld or live in the, on, on Earth. And so they make a deal, and they split her time between the underworld and the Earth. 
and Persephone just goes along with what they decided in the mediation. So interesting twist. In the modern world, we have the parties <laughs> individually represented. Next slide. Mediation, the contrast between mediation and arbitration. Again, it shares the characteristic of being voluntary, but key, it's non-binding. Again, you can alter anything by agreement. You can make a binding mediation. I would really say that's an arbitration. In, in the typical instance, a mediation is not binding. So you go in, you talk, but the mediator can't force anyone to do anything. It is supposed to be confidential, and Michelle is going to talk about that aspect of, of mediation. You choose the mediator in a mediation, and it's very informal. Unlike arbitrations, which tend to look a little bit more like civil litigation, a mediation is pretty much anything that the mediator feels will be the most effective way to resolve the dispute. Claim benefits of ADR, you can probably say these already from what I've said. They're supposed to be cheaper. They're supposed to be quicker. They're supposed to be confidential. You're supposed to be able to choose your decision maker. And of course, you're outside the public system. But what's the reality? The reality is these mediations and, and arbitrations are done by contract. And so often, the parties end up in court litigating what the contractual uh, agreements mean. So no matter how you look at it, eventually we get you back into the, into the court system with trial lawyers or barristers uh, taking, representing you. So the power to keep the matters confidential, which is a big selling point for mediations and arbitrations, is one of the issues that often gets litigated. We end up in court litigating about whether what can be litigated, how, oh, sorry, what can be confidential, how much can be confidential. And that aspect of alternate dispute resolution is what Michelle Calapetis is going to talk about more in detail. He's the tree. And with that, I will turn it over to Michelle. Yeah. I've been described many things, but I think tree it's the first. <laughs> As you were sitting, I sit there thinking, what sort of tree do you think I am? <laughs> Oak tree, no, not distinguished enough. So I thought this I must be a baobab tree, the sort of shape fits. Um, <clears throat> I have here copies of what I prepared for this evening, for those of you who are really um, sad people who like to read lots of things. But I'll just pass them around if anybody wants it. I'm not going to read it all the way through because um, we'd be here well beyond dinner time, and keeping lawyers from their dinner is, is a capital offence. <clears throat> Let me move on from what um, Suzelle was talking about to a little table which shows a comparison between traditional methods of dispute resolution and mediation. And I do so for this reason. The contrast is hugely important to the question of confidentiality. People ask me, why did I go into mediation? Well, 40 years at the bar, Coming out of court, even having won a case, to be met by the client saying, is that justice? Is that all I get? The judge said this, but he didn't know that. And I wanted to say this, but I was prevented. And it, it <coughs> drove home to me the inadequacy of court proceedings for resolving disputes between human beings, even companies, because companies are human <coughs> beings with a shell over the top. And then I saw a demonstration by Philip Norton, God rest his soul, on um, mediation, and that just said, that's the way through. So I then had CEDA, one of the leading organizations, into chambers, trained uh, 10 of my barristers and two solicitors who made up the numbers. And uh, then I didn't look back. And then after a few years, I found I was doing more mediation than litigation. And for commercial soup, that wasn't a good idea. And so I left and founded the company, and since then I've been full-time mediating. <coughs> the importance of mediation, going through the list there, is that it's private and confidential. I'll come back to that. You can see there that um, litigation can be protracted, as uh, Suzelle was talking about in, in the States. I think we're a bit better here. Two years, I think, is the average of case getting heard. Arbitration can be protected. I'm going, doing an arbitration at the moment. It's been going on for five years. Absolutely outrageous, but uh, it happens. 
Pleadings are a necessary part of litigation. Arbitration also. There's no pleadings in mediation at all. You formulate what you want the mediator to read. You exchange with each other what documents you want to exchange. You probably will have a bundle. And then that's it. Litigation is limited to what is pleaded. Arbitration is limited to what's the, in the arbitral agreement. Litigation exacerbates emotions. Everybody knows that. And similarly, arbitration, although it's supposed to be in private. In, in mediation is different. It's not a spectator sport, as litigation and arbitration is. The reverse of this room, the judge sits up there somewhere. In front of him is his clerk, associate. Then there's the QCs, then there's the junior barristers, then the solicitors, and the client sits back here somewhere. Totally removed from the action, listening to an interchange between the judge and the lawyers in a language he doesn't understand. The judge asks a question, Mr. Calipetis, what did your client say about so-and-so? I turn to my junior, what does he say about so-and-so? Junior says, what does he say about so-and-so? Sister says, Clark, what does he say about so-and-so? Back he comes. And by the time he comes to me, it's ceased to have the immediate effect of the client actually answering the question. And when I then reformulate it in a language that I think the judge might like to hear, I said, well, I never said that. But he said he did, but in a different way. The essence of mediation, I thought about it, and it seemed to me that I come to some slides in a moment. It's not spectator sport. The client participates in it. And the mediator is not a judge or an arbitrator. I decide nothing as a, as a mediator, except how parties should behave. Occasionally approving lawyers if they overstep the mark. Occasionally reminding lawyers that I do know something about the law when they're talking absolute nonsense. And uh, reminding people of the realities of life which is usually the cost so far, the cost going forward, what's actually in dispute. And it isn't as if I have to have a settlement. I don't have to have a settlement at all. Nothing to do with me. People say, are your mediations successful? I say, my mediations are always successful. Clients don't always settle. And that's an important distinction. If people leave a mediation without a, a settlement, I, people say, are you disappointed? I'm not. But I am disappointed they don't know three things. First, as a result of the mediation process, and it is a process, not a, a limited period of time, which is another important distinction, they must know precisely why they haven't settled, what the issue is, what's holding them apart. Is it a matter of law? Is it a dispute of fact? Is it a difference of view? Is it, God forbid, experts disagreeing about what the expertise should be applied results in? Second thing, what the consequences are. So I always insist parties actually tell me roughly how much it's going to cost to take the case through to the end of trial. Because then each issue that's in dispute has a price tag. And matters of principle shrink into nothing once they realize the cost of litigating a matter of principle. And lastly, people need to know what each side's real bottom and top line is. Because sure as exits after the uh, Mediation, if they haven't settled, there will come a time when they wish they had, and they need to know where they wish to go. So mediation, I say, is not a participation sport. It is very much, um, the, the, sorry, not a spectator sport. It's very much a participation sport. And uh, it is totally and utterly without rules in terms of what you can do. Just a very short example traditional way of getting out of a contract is to go to your sister and trawl through something the other side of done, fabricates a fundamental breach, writes a letter, we accept your fundamental breach, end of contract, other side says, I'm not in fundamental breach, you are. No, you're not. And each sue each other for damages, they're in court, argue about who's, who's at fault. But all you want to do is to rearrange the contract. In mediations, recast contracts, redrafted boundaries, Redrafted share agreements, everything is possible because people sit around a table and say, what's the problem? What do we need to do? How are we going to fix it? And all I do is help them get to, to fix it. What I don't do is decide. And that's why the confidentiality is so important. <clears throat> I get people to sign an agreement which has this clause in it. The parties of the media shall keep confidential and regard as privileged 
and shall not use in any information of any nature produced for or arising in connection with the mediation save, and that as may be necessary, you see the exceptions there. Then 11.2, keep confidential and regard as privileged and shall not use what happened and what was said at the mediation and the terms of any settlement unless the settlement agreement has the same confidentiality terms, in which case those will prevail. I explain that to people who haven't mediated. What that means is this. Nothing that anybody says in the mediation, no figures agreed, arguments accepted or points conceded can be used outside the mediation if we don't succeed in resolving it and you end up in court or in arbitration without everybody else's written consent. That's a measure they understand. I must say, when I do say that, I have all my fingers crossed, in case I said, well, can the court compel us to give evidence about it? It's a question thus far I've never been asked. And if I were to be asked, frankly, I don't know the answer. Because of the English law state at the moment, it means it's uncertain. This is further confidential. All documents created for the mediation, no formal record should be made, and each party shall be sure that everybody else will abide by the terms of confidentiality. So mediation is a contractual process, which is why I get all parties and people who come along as friends or as advisors to sign the agreement. So that everybody is bound to the same contract with me. So it's a three-way contract. If there are more than two parties, as often there are, then it's a five-way contract, six-way contract, whatever the case may be. But everybody's bound by these terms. So it's important that they are, in fact, they mean something. Now, I made it clear at the start, there are endless types of mediation. Family mediation, mediation for uh, matrimonial disputes, mediations for uh, um, community mediation. I'm not talking about those at all. As far as this evening is concerned, I'm talking only about commercial disputes, international or national, but where the parties are always represented. They have lawyers, QCs, and also possibly experts as well. That's the type of mediation which I think is important because the one question I'm always asked by particularly American organizations, how safe is it? How can we be certain these documents aren't going to be used in litigation in the States if we have to sue there the same client? What protection can you guarantee we have? And I can't. I do the best I can to assure them that it's unlikely, but at the moment the state of the law is such <coughs> that I can't guarantee you that everything created for the mediation is confidential. The reason is this. Common law, I'm leaving civil law countries out of it for the moment. Common law countries are divided between those who have a blanket ban on anything that transpires in mediation being used in evidence. And California is the prime example. And the California Evidence Code prohibits the introduction in evidence of anything at all that's said or communicated in the course of a mediation. Even, uh, unhelpfully, uh, the fact of a settlement itself. Uh, Dom was telling me how they get round and doubtless he'll entertain you, but it seems to me that's far too far. It has this consequence. Castle and the Superior Court, the Supreme Court reversed a decision where a lawyer had been given specific instructions by his client, I do not want to settle for less than $2.5 million. What did the lawyer do? He signed an agreement on behalf of his client for one5 Straight malpractice, straight, and not just negligence, straight disobedience to the uh, retainer. So he sued and wanted to introduce the fact that in the mediation he said, I don't want to settle for less than 2.5. Not allowed. The judge, uh, at the first instance, allowed it, but the Supreme Court said no and recited the evidence code, which you see there on the screen, that all discussions contained, conducted in preparation for mediation as well as all mediation-related communications that take place are protected from disclosure. Absolutely wrong. They went further, and rather surprising for us rather more liberal-minded uh, lawyers, they approved of the observations in a case called Wimsat, where the judge describing mediation said when clients such as the malpractice plaintiff in that case participate in mediation, they are in effect relinquishing all claims for new and independent torts arising from the mediation, including legal malpractice causes of action against their own counsel. Now, 
I think there isn't a, a country in the world, apart from California, who thinks that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but the opposite end of the spectrum is what we have in this country. The courts almost universally, with a few notable and laudable exceptions, simply regard mediation, and I'm quoting, as assisted without prejudice negotiations. And therefore, subject to all the exceptions to which without prejudice negotiations are, namely, they can be set aside, and you'll find the case was Procter & Gamble, Robert Walker, LJ, giving the judgment and resume of the law, if you're following the notes, it's a paragraph eight, um, where issues whether without prejudice communication have resulted in concluded compromise agreement, the court has tried to look at the without prejudice negotiation to see if there's an agreement. I'll come back to that, because one of the essentials of mediation is every contractual mediation agreement that I know of contains the clause, and I say to clients, the whole process is non-binding, unless and until we get an agreement which is put into writing and signed by all parties. Now, that's essential, because it means whether there are more than one issue, we could take it issue by issue, if we could agree one matter, put that to one side, go on to, and so on, until everything has been agreed. But even then, even if you've agreed everything, you each have an opportunity to look at the whole package without being bound in law before you sign up to it. But that's essential, because as all negotiators will know, you'll give on one point, you'll take it back on another point. And so at the end of the day, the whole package is important before you actually commit yourself as a matter of law to it. And what courts have done is to ignore that. Brown and Patel is a case, which will come to in a moment. But all the exceptions to the without prejudice rule being applied in mediation, in my respectful submission, and with great respect to some of my judge's friends, uh, is just wrong. And the difficulty is that it's going to undermine the confidence in the mediation process by the international business community. Because once it gets known that English courts will look at mediation communications on a series of seven or eight exceptions, then the guaranteed confidentiality of the process has gone. I have a solution which is somewhat novel, which I suggest at the end. Um, but in essence, uh, courts have paid lip service which is why the somewhat rude title of this lecture is Judicial Myopia or Willful Blindness. They paid lip service to the idea that mediation proceedings should be confidential. In Halsey, which is the seminal case on mediation, Lord Justice Dyson in term said, um, we made it absolutely clear uh, that it's common ground, that, and we adopt parties titled in an ADR to adopt whatever position they wish, and if as a result the dispute is not settled, that's not a matter of court. And they were absolutely right. It was our submission as well as the law society's. It's not for the courts to investigate why people didn't arrive at a settlement. But that doesn't prevent the courts investigating without prejudice communications to see if there was a settlement. But then when I heard, read the phrase, without assisted without prejudice negotiation, I remember, of course, this, we are commemorating these years, the dreadful World War I experiences. And uh, looking online in a sort of idle moment, I came across a couple of pictures and thought, that's what assisted without prejudice negotiations are. The first was this. That's one side. People have their view. They sit in their trench. They fire their points across the table at the other side. And the other side sit in their trench and fire their points back. Now, that typifies to me negotiations without prejudice, where parties have a position, they stay with their position, and they try and negotiate across a, a, a minefield. Of course, if it's an assisted without prejudice negotiation, the poor so-and-so who's the assistant has to go to no man's land. And we all know what happens to somebody who stands in no man's land with both sides shooting each other, he gets shot, poor bugger. So if you can get the parties into no man's land, that's what happens. That's what happened Christmas 1916, as what happens in a mediation. Rather than sit either side of a court, parties sit around the table together and they discuss matters. And if they don't discuss matters, I encourage them to discuss matters. I ask questions of clients and say, you know, I say, my clients don't want to speak in the mediation. I'm going to speak fine. I say, let's, 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 let's see. 
So I get the usual from the lawyer, spouting out their case, how they go to massacre the other side, millions of pounds in damages. And I reach to the end of the wallhead, they say, and uh, I ask the client a question. Look, as I understand it, you say that on that particular occasion, the CEO of the other side made you this promise. Is that right? Now, it's going to be a pretty brave lawyer who's going to start saying, Michelle, I'm not going to let him answer that question, because that's his case. And of course, once the client answers the question, I turn to the other client. Is that, do you accept that, or you've got a different version? And before anybody knows what's happened, they are talking to each other for the first time since they started litigation. Because clients communicating through solicitor's letters is hopeless. Half the time, they don't understand what's being written. The other half of the time, all that the, the solicitors are doing, bless them, is stirring up the emotion, stoking up the fires of litigation. It's their job. But so I insist on getting the clients actually speaking to each other. And that's what happens. And invariably, if they don't settle on the day, they will settle within a short period of time before trial. I'll come at the end to a particular uh, statistic which I've collated, which might be surprising. There are several cases where there was an attempt to try and uh, use the decision Halsey to set aside the mediation privilege, uh, and it didn't work. There's a famous case of Savings and Finken, which you'll find there, where, um, uh, not Hoffman, I think it was Mr. Justice Hoffman then, said in, in the case of um, unambiguous impropriety, uh, the privilege wouldn't run. Uh, that's been affirmed now in several cases. Um, in other cases, the judges have said no mediation privilege must be preserved. But then we came to Brown and Patel. Now, Brown and Patel, it's worth looking at the facts because, as always, when you look at the facts, you realize why the decision was made. And bad cases make bad law. We all know that. At a time when she was subject to an individual voluntary arrangement, Mrs. Rice purchased a property, sorry, a purchase, sorry sold a property to Mrs. Patel for 250000 but didn't tell her IVA supervisor. As a result, she was made bankrupt. Her trustee brought proceedings under the Insolvency Act against Mrs. Patel, alleging that she had bought at an undervalue. <coughs> Three-day trial was set, uh, had a mediation, all day long in the mediation, and uh, at the end of the day, one side was at 80,000, the other side was at 40,000. And there they stuck. The council had to go back to London. They said to the, to the meeting, look, I'm sorry, we can't do anything more tonight. I've got to catch this train. I'm in court tomorrow somewhere else. Um, mediator, can I have a word with the clients? <coughs> of course you can, but there's no deal tonight. Mediator said, well, are you prepared to leave both offers on the table to noon tomorrow? And both clients said, well, okay, we can do that. Well, of course, the inevitable happened. So a phone call the following morning from the, uh, Mr. Brown, the trustee, uh, threatening Mrs. Patel in somewhat choice language. Unfortunately for him, Mr. Patel had taped the whole conversation, so when he saw his witness to say, I, I inquired of Mrs. Patel whether she'd be willing to perhaps raise her son a little bit. In fact, what he was saying is, if you don't accept my offer, I'm going to put bailiffs in and bankrupt you as well, which wasn't a very good thing for a trustee to say, but there we are. Um, and at one minute to noon, he instructed his sisters to accept the offer from the other side. We had all the nonsense then that it was one minute after noon. We had timing on the, on the fax machine and everything else. It was an absolute nightmare. And they applied to court on the basis that there had been a concluded deal on the basis that this was without prejudice negotiations, which resulted in a settlement. Applied to court. Court said, yes, you could have the evidence and demanded that the evidence go in for hearing. Uh, it was transferred to Chancery. So we had three days in Chancery. And I appeared as an intervener on behalf of mediation sanity. And um, the judge rejected the first argument, which was, if it's not a written agreement, why are we bothering? Standard agreement. It would be the end of it. No, I'm entitled to hear evidence as to whether or not the parties have concluded an agreement orally, in spite of the fact they signed the agreement. Well, after two days' argument, he decided they did uh, said they would have an oral agreement, but having reached an oral agreement, that was then subject to the terms of the mediation contract, therefore it had to be in writing, and as it wasn't in writing, therefore it wasn't effective. Well, Stuart is a good friend, and 
I did observe him afterwards. All he had done was to spend two days going around and disappearing up his own orifice. But um, uh, <laughs> he, he paid me the ultimate compliment of coming to me as a pupil mediator once he'd done his training as a mediator. So it wasn't all bad. But that case um, let the door open for people to adduce evidence of what transpired in a mediation in spite of the fact they had agreed that nothing would be binding in terms of writing. So it's, it's the thin end of the wedge. The next case, which is really quite startling, I'm going to skip now, um, to Farm Assist. Now, Farm Assist was a case involving uh, DEFRA, foot and mouth disease compensation. There was a mediation in which both sides were represented by leading counsel. Each side had their own experts and, of course, solicitors and God knows how many paralegals. And they reached a settlement. At the, after the settlement was reached, the farmer, who was a claimant, um, went into liquidation. An organization called Ruffle Plant Hire bought from the liquidator a cause of action and brought an action to set aside the settlement agreement on the grounds of undue influence and inequality of bargaining power. Well, you might wonder, even if you're not a lawyer, if there's a party there with QCs, junior counsel, experts and solicitors, how is it that party entered into agreement under any undue influence? This will seem to be as barkingly obvious that uh, this is a fabricated claim. However, Ruttle Plant Hire brought a case. It came in front of Viv Ramsey, who was a trained mediator. And... Uh, Without going through all the complicated details, it turned out that the transfer of the right of action was faulty, so he threw the case out. Whereupon the liquidator resurrected the company and brought the action himself. So this is the second time round, and this is where then uh, um, Viv Ramsey made an order that the mediator attend to give evidence. Uh, and she wrote a letter, as she was invited to do so, and uh, she said this you will appreciate that this mediation occurred many years ago, in fact, six years ago. And in the intervening period, I've conducted up to further, 50 further mediations a year. I therefore have very little factual recollection of the mediation. Further, having retrieved my file, I find there's a certain amount of correspondence, a copy of the mediation agreement, and the names of the party, but nothing else. I've got no recollection at all. I can't possibly assist. Notwithstanding that response, the... Um, Lenny Judge ordered the witness summons to stand on the basis that the allegations that the settlement group was entered due to an economic duress of what was said and done in mediation necessarily involves evidence from what pharmacist says was said and done by the mediator. This evidence formed a central part of pharmacist's case and the mediator's evidence is necessary for the court properly to determine what was said and done. That's in spite of the fact that the mediator, which he accepted, had no recollection at all, no notes, and it was six years previously, and some uh, 250, 300 mediations afterwards. Although the mediator had said clearly that she had no <coughs> recollection, this doesn't prevent her from giving evidence. Frequently, and this is a phrase which you might find surprising if you're not a lawyer, frequently memories are jogged and recollections come to mind when documents are shown to witnesses and they are cross-examined and use a criminal case to support that proposition. And contrary, calling the mediator wouldn't be contrary to the terms of the agreement, which like every standard agreement says, nobody will call the mediator to give evidence, didn't apply because that was the underlying dispute. This is a totally fresh dispute, therefore the mediation agreement didn't apply to it. And uh, the parties waived their privilege. And while the mediator had the right to rely on confidentiality provision in the mediation agreement, this is a case where the interest in justice lies strongly in favour of evidence being given of what was said and done. Now, the curious feature is this. Before he delivered that judgment, the parties settled the case. So it was end, finished. Notwithstanding that, at the party's request, the judgment was published and caused endless problems thereafter because the rules of the Supreme Court had to be amended immediately and when you get to subparagraph ZZ in the Supreme Court rules, you think, well, something can't be absolutely right. 
He relied upon a decision of Reed E. Minus, which is Lord Denning's decision, which said there's a very specific confident, uh, privilege where you're dealing with children. But, and the court was offended, this is not to be used for any other case. Nonetheless, that was the justification. Well, that was the situation then, as I say, as far as the English courts are concerned. It's been followed in Canada. It's been followed in uh, Australia. And the difficulty is that whilst you've still got that on the books, as it were, you have this problem. Can you guarantee confidentiality? The answer is no, you can't. So what's the solution? It seems to me that the courts ought to recognise that the mediation is not litigation, is not arbitration. If the parties, and it's a voluntary process, if they choose to resolve their dispute themselves with the assistance of a mediator, that should be recognised as a totally separate method of resolving disputes and given a privilege of its own. And the privilege that I have devised is that once the parties have agreed to mediate, nothing which is communicated in any form before, during mediation, etc., may be used outside the mediation without the written consent of the parties and the mediator, unless one is necessary to enforce or implement a concluded written agreement, <clears throat> not to determine whether agreement had been reached, mark you, but whether, having parties having signed it, that was the agreement. So that gets around the difficulty California was in. Secondly, it's necessary for the overriding consideration of public policy of the country where the settlement agreement is to be enforced, which should be limited to children, everybody accepts that, I mediated disputes with the official solicitor and the guardians, and everybody knows anything that's said in the mediation can be used by them in court. Everybody accepts that, but that's an exception. Secondly, um, to prevent harm to the physical or psychological integrity of a person, to prevent the commission of a crime, the interest of national security. I'd add one there, if necessary, which is fraud. But fraud unravels everything anyway. So you don't need to have the exception spelled out. But if it makes people happier, I'm happy to add fraud there. And then lastly, of course, unless the documents would be disclosed in any event, in any proceeding. Now, it seems to me that has the virtue of creating a special privilege, which is quite identified, recognized by all courts, and enforced. It doesn't deprive anybody of any action, because if they want to sue their lawyer for the case in Castle, sue your lawyer. Everybody knows that if you sue your lawyer, you waive your privilege. And so what communicated between the lawyer and the client, be it in mediation or outside of mediation, is governed anyway by the ordinary laws of evidence. If you want to sue the mediator for some alleged slight or undue pressure, you have a contractual arrangement with the mediator, sue under the contract. If the mediator breaches confidentiality, for example, by disclosing to one side something that he learned from the other that he shouldn't have done, sue him for the damages if he suffered any. What you do not need is the court involved in a process trawling through a mediation to try and find out whether or not a complaint is made out. It was done once, a case called the Earl of Malmesbury, where Mr Justice Jack decided that the rule that a party who ref unreasonably refused to mediate should be penalised in costs could extend to a party who unreasonably behaved in a mediation. And we had three days, <coughs> affidavits from both sides of solicitors, all the paralegals' notes transcribed to determine whether or not somebody had behaved unreasonably in a mediation. The costs were nearly £6 million on a claim which started at £80 million, but which the judge awarded less than one. And three days then argued about who should pay those costs. The unsuccessful party appealed to the Court of Appeal, by which time the costs had reached nearly 10. And it was then mediated by one of my colleagues successfully, one of the conditions being, and this is all Chatham House rules here, that the Earl of Marsby was never to know how much his solicitors had charged in costs. <laughs> so, mercifully, that's not been followed. Several very senior judges have said this is absolute nonsense. The last case was Mrs. A.B., where, as so often happens, the parties didn't finish the mediation with the settlement of the day appointed for the mediation. <clears throat> but they continued talking thereafter, using the mediator to put offers to each other. On one of them, one party went to nap, 
I said, do you? The other party said, no, no, we haven't put it in writing. We're not happy with that. They then sued, and the mediator was summoned to give evidence as to what had transpired in the telephone calls. The judge describing the mediator in these terms, the, the mediation hearing having been concluded. Now, that's a clue that the judge was thinking mediation is a court hearing. The mediator's involvement with the consent of the parties was nothing more or less than an ad hoc go-between, whatever that means. But it meant that he wasn't a mediator, it wasn't covered by any form of mediation, confidentiality or privilege, and therefore the mediator was obliged to give evidence about it. Again, just wrong. I'm sorry for Anthony Edward Stewart, he's a very good friend of mine, and he mediated with me, but that was just wrong. And it, inexplicable. What I do now, what everybody else does, is if a mediation hasn't finished, but the party want to continue talking, I join the mediation. Continue the process until the date, until you tell me you don't want to continue anymore, and all communications are if we're still sitting around the same table in the mediation. It's very simple. One little statistic, in case people think that mediations will not be supported by the com commercial business community. I make it a rule, as I said, to ask people to give me how much you've spent so far, how much you will spend if you don't succeed. I do roughly 100 mediations a year. 80% settle on the day or before trial. One year, two years ago, I added up all the costs of the parties that had settled and averaged them out. And the average was 450,000 pounds for all the parties. Times 80, you see the figure yourself. That's the figure that those parties didn't spend on wasteful, useless litigation, not counting management time, not counting the sheer personal cost of giving evidence and preparing for trial, which those of you who've been involved will know only too well. And I'm only one mediator. There are at least a dozen of us in our full time, and all I can say is that anybody who thinks that mediation isn't here to stay had better think again. But to make it work and to fulfill the promise that the judges give that the process will be protected, make sure we get a proper mediation privilege, please. So what I want to do in just a few remaining minutes here um, is to focus you on the fact that, from you, as you've heard from these speakers, there has been a great sea change with regard to arbitrations and mediations over the last 30 years. So much so that you might say, well, why does litigation remain here at all? Why isn't it all arbitrations and mediation? So the scholarship and the people practicing in these areas have pointed out a number of problems and issues that I want you to be aware of so that we can have some discussion of those. And then I want to finish with trying to tease out just a little bit, if we can, what really is behind this tremendous success to mediations, because it is tremendous. It is utterly successful. What is it that's working in the mediation system that has been so successful over 30 years? So let's look at some problem areas first. And I divide these into four areas for you to think about. Issues in arbitration. Right, so we're in arbitration now where there's an actual decision, not the voluntary, let's talk about it. The arbitration, we've heard, is done not in the public process. It's without accountability of that decision of the arbitrator. In most of them, as Suzelle has pointed out, unless you provide specifically for an appeal, there's no judicial review if the arbitrator gets it wrong. And then there's no public scrutiny scrutiny whatsoever of that decision because it's private and confidential. If you think that's unimportant, look at these comments. The Strauss Institute, which is one of the leading mediation arbitration institutes in the United States, in fact, the head of the Strauss Institute, was a speaker here at the Howard and Smith lectures about four or five years ago, very prestigious institution. In a survey they did, it showed that 25% of the arbiters feel free to follow their own sense of equity and fairness in rendering an award, even if it would be contrary to the applicable law. Now, those of us nursed and grown up on the common law feel that 
the way justice and fairness has been incorporated by this process of accretions case after case after case may not always be apparent, but there's a sense to it. If 25% of the arbitrators are doing something that they feel is right, but it's contrary to applicable law, then we're developing something here apart from that legal system that isn't seen by the public, which is having an impact in the way decisions are made in a quarter of the cases. And then when you look at cases like the Machovia Securities case, in which they attempted to appeal, what the Court of Appeals acknowledged was a wacky interpretation of a contract, the court held that's not sufficient grounds for review. The arbitration is final and binding, absent extrinsic fraud, final and binding, no matter how wacky. So before we embrace it completely, I want you to think about some of these problems. We've heard that a mediation arbitration is voluntary. The parties have to agree. And I want you to look first at the bottom of this. Because I think where international arbitrations and construction defect arbitrations, these specialized arbitrations, where arbitration is most effective, it's in those areas where there's a particular expertise to the arbitrator. Where I think it is least effective and causes the most problems is with consumers. So you have arbitration clauses in fine print in contracts, contracts of adhesion. You don't get the product online if you don't click that you accept the terms. You don't get your credit card honored if you haven't accepted that long list of terms that you've never read. So it went up in kindred nursing centers last year to the Supreme Court of the United States, 2017, state of Kentucky. The court there held that the arbitration clause was inconsistent with the fundamental law of the Constitution of the state of Kentucky that you had an inalienable right to a jury trial, which of course you don't have in arbitration. The Supreme Court said no. The parties agreed to an arbitration. The right is not inalienable. The form contract was upheld in kindred nursing. Now, right now in California, and I think some of that press has seeped over here, and throughout the United States actually, but California is the big branch of Wells Fargo Bank, we're confronted with the problem of Wells Fargo Bank opening, without the knowledge of its customers, phantom accounts for them, and charges being accrued to these accounts. And it opened many, many thousands of these accounts, employees of Wells Fargo. So it's gotten the attention of the legislature in California, and what the legislature says is, well, yes, there are arbitration clauses that those customers sign, but surely for something this important affecting this many people, we can't compel them to arbitrate. They have a right to go to the jury trial. Now, that's getting some traction in the legislature, but every dispute is important to somebody, whether it's a lot of them or not. Every amount of money or issue is important to someone. The reasons really don't make sense in terms of being arguments against the arbitration if you believe the kindred nursing home result. I think, by the way, and I can't spend more time on this tonight, but I think where this scheme will go, if I'm seeing the future just a little bit through the mist right, is that rather than attacking the right to arbitration itself, the way really that this needs to be addressed, this problem, is attacking the definition of agreement. Has there really been an agreement to arbitrate in these kind of situations? And I think when it goes up, it's not going to go up because there are a lot of people involved or it was a terrible thing that somebody did. But where it really has a chance after kindred nursing is in attacking the definition of what is really an agreement to arbitrate. Next slide. Third group of issues that arbitration mediation raise. We look at the judicial system that's public, appointments for life in our federal system, not owing to anybody, certainly once they're on the bench, uh, but in arbitration and mediation, they're paid for by the parties. There is marketing. There are issues of who are you going to be loyal to. The Strauss, uh, this is Duke University's survey, said they're generally screened by organizations accustomed to servicing business interests. They have interest in looking at arbitrators, so that's who generally screens many of these organizations. Large law firms may be repeat players that an arbitrator will have to deal with where a single 
individual or a smaller law firm may never come before that arbitrator again. Institutional parties, often defendants, may be repeat players. Are they really getting from an arbitration decision the fairness they, they should expect from someone who has absolutely no interest in the outcome or in further employment? I just raise it as an issue. Next one. This one, I think, is a little more subtle but important to us as lawyers. When you think about the goals of the law, it's not only to punish and deter and to compensate, but it's to educate. The law is there to teach the citizens where the boundaries are, where the, where the lines are drawn. There's an educational function to the law. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, many years ago, said very clearly and very correctly, I think, that the life of the law has not been the logic of the opinions, but it's been experience. It's been this brick by brick, accretions, new situation, a, a change in the rule, a variation in the rule. And when we put so much into arbitration, we get a situation where it's being done by agreement back in what Suzel called the star chamber. So I was discussing this recently with a classmate of mine from the Harvard Law School who's now a very respected federal judge in San Francisco. And he is handling right now this case, which I think you may have heard a bit over here, of the Uber executive who left and stole the secrets and went over to Waymo, I guess, which is a, a Microsoft or something, but there's a debate there. And after our discussion, I was very pleased to see this come out, next slide, by Judge Alsop uh, two months ago. Our federal courts belong to the public. And the public and the press have a legitimate interest in looking over the shoulders of the work in progress in our courts. Now, he was talking here about a confidentiality agreement, not an agreement to arbitrate, but very similar concerns. The essence of our work concerns evaluating competing arguments. The party should not hide those arguments under seal out of a desire to shroud their business dealings in secrecy. So we're again removing, when we go with arbitrations, we're removing that experience from the eye of the public. Next slide. All right, I raised four problem areas for you to think about, and I'm conscious of the fact that our blood alcohol is all getting very thin right now. Uh, so I'm gonna go very quickly through <laughs> three areas that I want you to think about and try to tease out here. I looked at commentators, I looked at, I talked to people who are experienced in the area, said, what, to what do you attribute, particularly in mediation, not arbitration so much now, this tremendous wave of success that mediation is having? What is it attributed to? And some have gone so far, this is by Thomas Stepanovich, who's the head of that Strauss Institute, as telling us that we've really reached the promised land here. Uh, we see advocate-controlled, adversarial, rights-based system giving way in large measure to client-controlled, cooperative, interest-based system. I'm not sure we're quite there yet in that promised land. Because the marketplace in a mediation, as a good mediator, like the one we had here tonight, by the way, when we met Michelle Calipetis, both we and the opposition had one at the top of both lists, and that was Michelle. And he did a mediation with us over two, two and a half days with 35 people in the room. But we all could agree on one thing. With this mediator, we had chosen someone who could help us. But the marketplace is always going to be the court. The comparison is always going to be, what happens if I don't settle? What would the court do? Now, we're from California, and so I think Hollywood often says these things crisply. And it did so in a movie around 10 or 15 years ago called Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon movie featured a man who was driving in Los Angeles, got lost, and got into a very bad section of town. His car broke down, and he was confronted by an African-American gang leader who had a gun and was harassing him. And then Danny Glover, an African-American actor, comes up in a tow truck because he's been called to take him out, and this exchange ensues. Tow truck driver, I've gotta ask you to let me go, he's now talking to the gang leader, to let me go my way here. This truck is my responsibility, and now that the car's hooked up to it, that's my responsibility too. The gang leader says, well, tell me this. Are you asking me as a sign of respect, or are you asking me because I've got the gun? And Glover says it so crisply. 
you ain't got the gun, we ain't having this conversation, <laughs> right? That's why I thought, that's what I thought. No gun, no respect. That's why I've always got the gun. The alternative, and what you're all, whatever the, the niceties and the civility and the flexibility, you're always comparing for your client, what is my likely outcome if I go over here, if I use the gun, rather than stay in the system? Next slide. All right. So what answers did I get when I looked at the commentators and when I probed those who do this as to why the mediation was so successful? The first one was that competent counsel for both sides should be able to discount risk and value a case within a range. Well, part of the problem with that is the first word, right? They've got to be competent. The, the biggest trial verdicts that my firm has ever received have been where the other counsel has badly evaluated the value of the case. That's when it goes to trial. And the point about this comment here is that's true in a negotiation with or without mediation. That should be true if that's the reason for the success, whether you have a mediator or not. Competent counsel can still evaluate the risk on both sides. So I don't think that one goes very far to explaining the success of mediation. What you hear from a number of mediators, not this one in particular, but from a number of mediators as well, we can make this into a non-zero-sum game. We can find a common interest. What he really wants is an apology. Uh, well, both labor and management don't want the factory closed. We can, we can have some common interests. We bring those to the fore. We can get it settled. And there are situations and mediators who can do that. And it's very helpful when it's done. But many, many mediations are just a straight tug of war between two points of view over one pot of gold. And how big is my slice and how big is your slice? And yet they still settle. So I don't think this can explain it all. Is it what we call the halo effect? The respect for the mediator. This gentleman has been on the bench or has done this many trials before he became a mediator. Is that what's explaining it? It has an effect. But when you have a Gulliver like you had tonight, you have a thousand Lilliputians who are also mediating cases, and many of them are also doing it with great success. So I don't think it can all be the great <coughs> effect of the mediator. Is it, some say, the ex cathedra effect? When you go into a mediation, the mediator says, well, you've had this, you've said that. But what I think is this, the mediator's opinion. Is it that that coming from the mediator, often a retired judicial officer or a very respected attorney, has such an impression on the parties? I think there's something to that one. I don't think it explains it all. Next one. What about this, risk protection? See, if I go into a mediation and my client is a corporation and it has a board to answer to, my corporate general counsel has a board to answer to, and the mediator has said, well, I think this is the right level or this is the right range after a day or two days or three days of mediation, you don't want to be the corporate employee who goes back, goes into trial, and then gets hit for 10 times that amount because you didn't take the recommendation of a mediator who urged you to settle at this point. You don't want to be the young lawyer who goes back to the law firm to the senior partner and says, I told him to put it aside even though the mediator recommended it. You want to be in a position where reporting back to boards and senior personnel if a careful, thoughtful mediator has recommended it, that protects everyone on your side because you've had an independent evaluation, if you will, of the case. I think this contributes a lot to the success. What about the fact that both parties have to agree? We've talked about it being voluntary. Both parties have to agree before there's ever going to be mediation. I see that as the first step in settlement. Because what you're saying when you agree to a mediation is there is some level at which I will settle this case. It's not what he wants. It's not what you know, they want to give. But there's some level at which I'll settle this case, or why am I going to a mediation at all? So I think to some degree, the fact that the parties have agreed to it is self-selection in the choice of settling a case. And then this one, I think, is very, very important. Michelle talked about letting the council have their say. And for example, when we did a mediation with him, I did give an opening statement. But it was not an opening statement about the law and all the reasons that we should win and they should lose. I needed to introduce my clients in that 
because there were insurance representatives, 35 people in the room in that mediation, and I had to have them understand that these were real people whose lives had been profoundly impacted. So it was that sort of an opening statement to introduce the people, show them a little before and after. In most mediations that Suzelle and I do nowadays, we prefer not to have any argumentative opening statements at all. As Michelle said, it gets all the instincts going in the wrong direction. It sets up for a fight rather than for a resolution. In some, we don't even meet with the opposing party at all. The mediator will shuttle back and forth, bring the parties together. You have to guess a little bit what's going on beyond the door. A skilled mediator can get more from them, not tell you, back and <laughs> forth, and so forth. So I think reducing this need for coming in there and doing the chest pounding, we're going to win, we're going to get this much, that much, I think is a very real factor in bringing <clears throat> mediations to successful conclusions. And by that, I mean actually resolved. Here's the last set of, of, of possibilities. Mediation is paid for by the parties. I identified that as having some issues earlier. I want to get something when I pay for it. Parties want to get something when they pay for it. When you pay for the mediator, for we had two in our case, it went on for two or three days, and we had a major case here in London. Uh, when you pay for that mediator, it's true you may be saving lots of money down the road, but you don't want to go in and come out with nothing to show for that. So again, I think just the fact that you're buying the mediation, you're paying for the mediation, puts the parties into a mindset where it's easier to get that, game, that, that uh, case settled. And then finally, um, we hear about game theory. I was very fortunate to study at the Kennedy School under Thomas Schelling, who was the Nobel Prize winner in game theory. And in game theory, we have two branches. Conflict, how to resolve conflict through figuring out where the opposition is going. And also cooperative theory, cooperative theory. And cooperation, collaborative <coughs> solutions, I think are something that really are fundamental to human nature. There's, we have conflict, that's a part. We want conflict. But I think we also want to be able to design something that's cooperative. So the classic conflict situation in game theory is the prisoner's dilemma. I think you probably, most of you know about that. That's where uh, two men are accused of robbing a bank, partners in the bank rob, in the bank rob bank robbery, and the attorney general or the uh, person from the AG's office gets them each in separately in custody, and he says, if you confess and, and tell, your, tell on your friend over there in the, in the next room, then, and he does it, you get a lighter sentence. I'll bargain for a lighter sentence. And he gets the full 10 years or whatever the larger sentence is. And you say the same thing to the other one in the other room. And in game theory, the solution which is reached unless you have really hard trained mafia people who never rat out a friend. Um, but the solution that's most commonly reached is that both confess and both get the larger, the larger <laughs> sentence. Right? That's the classic prisoner's dilemma, the dilemma because they can't know. How do you defeat the prisoner's dilemma? You defeat the prisoner's dilemma by, dilemma by communication. As soon as I can communicate with my colleague over in the other room, then I can hold tight, knowing he will hold tight. I can design a solution by which we both win relative to the AG in that case. So it is this ability to communicate through a trained mediator, someone who is skilled at doing so, who can bring us so often together on cases that I saw absolutely no chance of, um, of, um, of succeeding with. In fact, I complained to Michelle on one occasion. I said, you know, Suzelle and I, we don't advertise. We don't go into the newspaper. Our verdicts are our advertisement, and you're, you're ruining my advertising. <laughs> you know, I don't get anything for this. But it is an amazing thing to me still that um, the mediators are able so often, I think for some of these reasons, and you may be able to think of others, to bring people together in this process, which has been such a contribution to dispute resolution at a time when the numbers were going out of control. And therefore, even though there's nothing we like better, what Suzanne and I went into law for was to get up and try cases, and we still love to do that. Uh, the practical reality is that most of the time, overwhelmingly most of the time, both parties are better with a negotiated solution. And having a mediator who 
can bring that together, and they so often can, is a far better solution than going the long run through trial. So thanks very much. Why don't we take a few questions uh, from the questions or comments uh, from the group? Anyone have a question? No. Yes. The, the small amount of academic uh, literature that I've read uh, from uh, history and economic specialists in the US uh, arguing against um, uh, law and society people uh, takes the, um, the remark that uh, uh, businessmen should negotiate in the shadow of the law and denies that it's applicable. I, mean, I think I've heard quite a lot this evening about uh, uh, that, that suggests that uh, negotiation should always be. It, it, cannot, it cannot be otherwise. You have not. The question is whether the quote that businessmen um, should ne uh, negotiate in the shadow of law, whether that's inapplicable. It's impossible. Because I, I don't think there's anybody in this room who's had a credit card company come to you recently and say, how much would you like? Uh, you got any disputes? You want something? Uh, it always has to be that I have an alternative here. And I have an alternative which may hurt me, but it can also hurt you very much. And it's in that shadow of the law. I hadn't heard that particular quote, but you know, they say plagiarism is stealing from one person, research is stealing from many, so I'm going to take that, <laughs> add it to it. I like that very much, and I think it's the only way that it can occur. Any other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. If we accept the premise that the growth in ADR is partly driven by uh, problems, costs, uh, um, out of control aspects of litigation, do you think that having this mechanism of ADR actually lessens pressure on our systems of litigation to reform themselves and to cure some of these ills? I think it does, and I'll let Suzelle see if she has anything to add. It's always very hard to quantify because as we found in Los Angeles, when we added additional lanes to our freeways, the first effect was to increase the traffic. And uh, so one doesn't know um, what the effect would be if you didn't have it. But my experience, I think, so Suzelle, do you have a comment on that? Well, you would think the numbers, if you get something out of the system, it'll take the pressure off the civil system. But Don and I represent a number of corporate clients, and they're becoming more and more disaffected with arbitrations, not mediations like Michelle does, but the fact that there's no appeal, usually unless you had the foresight to put that in your agreement. And even then, it would be an appeal, unless you set it up, that it would go back into the civil system, it would be private appellate court. And because of that, the person who is unhappy with the result is really unhappy with the result. So our corporate clients are saying, never again. We got, you know, it only takes one $50 million result and you're burned for life and you're never gonna go back into the system, so. All right, so to close this up, I noticed, um, I did this tactically, I noticed when I last asked for questions, Lady Justice Arden also had her hand up. And so I deferred that because <laughs> I know I want to refer that one to Michelle Calipettis. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Justice Arden. Thank you very much. Thanks for that opportunity. Thank you, everybody, for uh, a most interesting evening. Uh, I want to put a question as a member of the public. I hear that my government is about to give a mining license to some company I don't much trust, and it's going to do open cast mining in an area where I live. And I'm very keen on the environment. Can I ask an environmental group to intervene? Will the, arbit uh, the mediators allow them to intervene, to put their point of view? And if not, can I go to a court and get an order that I do have a power to intervene? Michelle? There's a public interest here that I want to see represented. Well, the short answer is that um, anybody can attend the mediation if all the parties agree. I suspect in the instance you're talking about, the mining company wouldn't want outsiders in. The short answer is that mediation is consensual. You can't force somebody to mediate. The other side won't mediate. They'll say, if we can have our representative, if we can have our environmental people here to explain to you and the mediator what our problems are, we'll mediate. If you don't accept that, we won't mediate. So Persephone has to spend six months in hell and six on earth, <laughs> whether she likes it or not, in the public interest. Alan, can I turn it back over to you to close this formally, and then um, we'll continue, I hope, this discussion over yeah, drinks and dinner. Well, well thank, thanks, thanks to all three of you for such um, fascinating, I have no idea quite what to expect, but that was a, a, a masterful centerpiece, and the, the other the trees or the 
The bookends. <laughs> the bookends or the, or the oh, sandwiches or whatever they were, 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 were fascinating. Um, but there was a crucial bit in, in Don's presentation, I thought, when he mentioned that there was alcohol waiting at another part of the <laughs> um, And he put that fairly early into his presentation, and I'm sure of us, many of us are thinking about that. Um, not to say we weren't concentrating on the rest of what you were saying, no. but, but um, we have overrun a bit. So what I suggest is I shut up. Um, we go out of here, we walk um, 100 yards um, to Talbot Hall, there is alcohol, uh, and then after that we can eat. But thank you very much. They, that was all fantastic and um, lots to talk about. Thank you.